we're seeing now what the full impact of the of the pandemic is or maybe we don't see the entire scope but we're starting to see it i think up until now we've seen things we've been surprised we've been holding on we've been uh, worried about about what we were seeing but now we're seeing that okay we really need to change we really need to get together we really need to understand how do we see the future together uh, and how are we gonna get the governments to protect it to secure it there's obviously a big topic conversation for me is how readily everybody's just accepted this new world order and everyone's just like so frightened that they're just going along with whatever but the main thing for me is the most frustrating thing that I've started to rally the troops on is you know as an industry um, you know I do a lot of electronic you know we are the best problem solvers in the world we've led the way with everything that we do at festivals in terms of how we've kept everybody safe if you look at our health and safety well, we record. all used to break into a warehouse yeah. and set up a exactly. sound system in but, a day and move 10,000 people in up order the M25 to run legitimately, we can solve these problems in order to run legitimately we then went on to set up the best health and safety scenarios all, all sorts of parties and raves and, you know, more people die from drug-related deaths at rock and roll shows, by the way, rather than electronic shows, just wanted to point out. But I'm, I'm, I've sat and thought about what, how do we fix this? What is the solution? Why aren't we all coming up with better solutions? I know we have to deal with governments and laws. So I've been pushing and working with a lot of people, working out if we can do an effective testing model that works to run shows without social distancing. And so obviously, you didn't like the show at the Clapham Grand for 200 people seated to watch Frank Turner with a mask on stage with table service. Um, That's not a resolution it, that the not, government put forward? It's not whether I like it or not, because there will always be people that will agree to go and do that and artists that will perform under those conditions. And if that's what people want to do, I have no issue with it. I don't think it's sustainable for promoters or for anyone. I don't think there's any enough money in that to, to, to have the kind of business that we're used to at all. Some of these venues are hundreds of years old they were built with seats next to each other. You can't change that. You can't run a gig at 30, 40%. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Not for me, but for the production. And then the health and safety aspect of things, which is really ramped up in, you know, in Europe and America, makes things even more expensive. So the issue was actually capacity. When can you get back to capacity? There's eight billion bucks worth of concert tickets already out there so before you go booging a new one you got to fulfill all the old ones no one's got a start date remember this whatever anybody tells you oh we're rescheduling i can guarantee you nobody has a start date to how do you get if you've sold 10,000 tickets in a venue how do you then go back and say we'll do it over four nights well you're bankrupt so until you can clear the issue up of the millions of tickets that are sold at the capacity venues, you can't even rebook anything. It's, it's, a, it's terrifying. And that's just the live bit. I think we've got to be quite vocal because a lot of people are scared that our industry is going to be presented as though we don't care about people. And we know that's the opposite. We're very professional uh, and diligent. But we have to be very vocal and be able to go out there and put ourselves on the line and say this is really as important now for so many reasons. To plan for the business, one of the options is that we could actually not open. That there's no vaccine, there's nothing, and, and maybe we're in the same situation as last year. And then obviously the, the effect, it will be a lot worse than this year. However, we decided to, uh, to look at it positively and we think that for next year, we, we start already working on the, on the concept for next year and to see what the options will be and, and how we could modify our operations to, to adapt to a new reality and, and have different scenarios on the table that we believe that we will only be able to decide which one will happen after Easter. Because before that, it's going to be unpredictable. What we saw when um, lockdown started is that people resorted to the arts as a way of balancing out their mental health and lots of things went online, which was absolutely brilliant, but they were free. And I think people are now used in a way to not paying for things. And it, there's the expectation that things are gonna be free. So it was really interesting to see what Nick Cave did with his recent concert, um, The Idiot, Idiot Tree, which was performed beautifully, recorded really well. Um, but came to the charge. I think people are going to have to appreciate that live music costs and it's there for a reason. We've got thousands of jobs in the creative industries locally in Camden and we're really proud of them.
obviously there's a vaccine that needs to come there's but in that process and when people talk about no the vaccine is going to be next year say well we need to find a way to maintain everything until then we have to, to try, we have to see how it works, and we have to improve the procedures, technology, uh, the, all the science have to help as well. But we have to push, is our main concern, to open the 21 with, with safety. There is a very special treatment being allotted to COVID at the moment. And in reality, the death rates are no worse than a very bad flu year. And flu has a vaccine. so. If we move into the next stage, maybe if we learn to live with COVID, it will possibly be the same or less dangerous than the flu that already exists. Now, I'm not saying we should definitely do that, and I'm not an anti-vaccine person who says that, you know, maybe there'll be a wonderful vaccine in November, and maybe I'll want to take it in a couple of years' time when I know it's safe. But at the moment, I perceive the risk of taking it would be higher than the risk of me not taking it. So. I do think there's a, there's a really interesting debate here that we are not having because we are not allowed to consider half the options on the table. We have to only debate the absolute assumption that we want to work on numbers of deaths and how atrocious this is and no one will look at the economics of it uh, and the economics of life years and how old people are, are, are when they're dying and how much they're being affected and how people like my son who had a very promising starting career in the music industry at 19, 19 years old has had that career just taken away from him. What's the value? Can we literally plot it on a graph? Can we put it in a spreadsheet and decide what the value of a 30% reduction in a 20 year old's economic and social life prospects for his whole life is. How do you value that? Because I tell you what, your grandparents do not want their parents or their children to suffer over these sort of issues. So I just think, I'm not, I'm not trying to just say there is one or the other, I'm just saying the debate needs to be opened up and then we have to come up with the best solution. So my argument is why aren't we looking at testing models? Um, I've been talking with a lot of promoters in England about how we can do a test event. It's a hugely risky strategy and a lot of people when, I mean, I know Melvin Benz come out with this as an option. He's saying that he thinks that, you know, you test within seven days of an event in order to travel to the event and then you get tested on arrival so that you can go into the event and just have a nice time. It's not a guaranteed uh, thing but what it is it's mitigating risk so if you've done that level of testing with an effective test you could argue that it's as safe as I mean you can go to Glastonbury probably and clack, c catch TB or meningitis couldn't you if you yeah or flu right <laughs> so let's test for a corona seven days before and, uh, and on on the way in yeah but you could probably get but you, you see what I'm saying like and do do this see if it can work, see if it, and obviously you have to sign disclaimers for everything these days. I mean, I would imagine 150,000 Glastonbury fans, if they were asked to do two-step testing program in order to go to Glastonbury next year, they would do it. Absolutely. And I also don't understand why we as an industry aren't speaking to the audience and getting the audience on board to start saying, I want to go to festivals next year. How are we going to do this? They're not, everyone's just sitting around passively waiting for the solution to appear, talking about this never ending <coughs> discussion about a possible vaccine, which may or may not come in the next year, six months. So how can we, if we can't do that, how can we run say as safely as possible? Well, stop tourism, stop tourism, get a vaccine and cut it out, especially on little islands like this, where you can practically cut it out. I know that it depends also about the sanitary situation, but in any case, we have to work to have a very good 21. I mean, we're gonna need the test to become something part of our lives. We need to test ourselves for everything. I just went to see my family and I did my test before I went to see my family. I couldn't take the risk. So I think it's be, that is gonna become part of our lives as well. Now in these moments, it's true that there are more cases appearing. It's true that more tests 
are done because they're identifying the non-symptomatic cases and they are doing tr uh, tests to all the people is related and they are doing uh, a following up of all the cases. So some more cases are appearing, but it's true that for the moment at the island, the serious cases or the, let's say collapses in the hospital or the medical centers are not the case. So I think we're still quite safe here. As well as the vaccine, there are some people who have been working on something that could be really great for our industry all round, which is that they can test, they, you can basically have a test immediately there, a bit like a pregnancy test, like these tests for COVID, but they can come up on your app. There's no data uh, tracking, so the data concerns are out the way, but it tests you there and then, and then you can go into the arena. These things are all really important, and I think that's why we have to have a combined response, both from the point of view of associations, but also in terms of having the public get involved and rally around with us. I mean, listen, I, th I think the entire world is getting behind cure for a vaccination. I think everybody knows that whoever the, the, the pharmaceutical company or the government that, that is the, the first person to get to the solution is absolutely going to make a ton of money on it and ultimately help the world out. So I think all the resources that can be put behind that right now are probably the best possible thing because you read, you know, the stories change daily. How long somebody's, uh, you know, got the immunity or the, um, uh, you know, the antibodies. Once they have been infected, you hear whether you can get infected outside with droplets in the eyes or not. I mean, stories change daily. So I think ultimately, if we really expect to get, quote unquote, back to normal, then it's, it's ultimately going to be all about a cure or vaccination. And whether it has to be annual, like a flu you know, virus, and we all get annual flu shots or not, you know, I don't know. But I think, it's, I think at this point, we can do our best to get production up and running. We can do whatever. But if, if we're going to have to protect our fans, if we're going to have to protect the artists, if we're going to have to protect the music creators, it's going to have to be a cure of vaccination. So I think, that's where, I think that's where the effort has to be spent. And I think everybody's trying. I mean, I think everybody around the world knows that there's a race for this. And, and, it, and I think resources are being put behind it. There, there are mistakes being made across the way. But I think everybody knows that's the one solution. I don't think hospitals should be overloaded so you can't you can't treat anyone so so I do think there has to be a level of control about this I'm not suggesting there isn't but we live in this cancel culture society where we aren't even allowed to suggest that uh, letting and people get the virus is an option because it absolutely is an option now unless we discuss the consequences of that then we are not having a balanced and fair debate because more people are dying, well, eight, eight times more people are dying of cancer. You know, road, road traffic accidents is roughly the same figures as, um, as, as COVID. Uh, malaria, um, you know, smoking kills at least four times as many people as, as, you know, drinking kills at least twice. It's a bad year, but what we know for sure is the island has, um, is the same island that people want to visit. I think the will to visit Amvitha, to enjoy the music, the nature, and the island itself is still there. I think uh, we have to work together to, 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 to pass this situation and to try to do the best 21 is possible. Now we're actually driving the agenda. So we've actually got a strong document which presents itself in a way that compares with other businesses that have been allowed to be released from lockdown and showed the comparative in terms of exposure, showed the comparative in terms of the age profiles that are attending these venues uh, and the vulnerabilities off the back of that and how to mitigate all of those risks within environments that are already existing and measures that are already taking place. So uh, that, that document and that piece of work is going out over the next seven days. Um, and, and hopefully off the back of that, that's going to start a discussion which is going to lead to a pilot which we should be able to try to engage government in showing and, and assessing the best way to move forward, similar to the live sector. So the work is being done in the background. The challenge that we've got is, is government are, you know, they're, they're, they, they don't know our industry yeah. is being quite frank. And they've gone from being a, uh, a very risk averse position to managing risk, which is what we've got to take advantage of. Um, and we're doing that very well. We've got a consortium of people working forward. We're about to release this piece, which is hopefully will give us that opportunity to do some of those pilot schemes, whether it be in venues, nightclubs, uh, festival spaces, 
where we're looking at reduction in capacity, we're looking at uh, tests on entry, we're also working with a company that do antibody testing prior engagement. So there's lots of work going into the background that's gonna mitigate risk on top of the things that we're already doing within an operational process. Um, because we carry so much of it, which, you know, let's be honest about it. If you go into a pub, you haven't got security, you haven't got air change, you don't do tests on door, it's very loose, track and trace is very moderate. Whereas when you look in a nightclub or a, a venue, track and trace is part of your license, you've got a security team on board, the air change is a lot more systematic, your cleaning on night by night is stronger. So there's no reason why government really shouldn't take us seriously and allow us the opportunity to engage. Uh, and, and be able to restart our business. But we need to drive that agenda. If we leave it to government, they're just going to think we're sweaty venues and not be able to you know, accept that there is an opportunity to open. But I really, really believe in testing as a way forward, as a way of, there's got to be a way to, to, to be able to run a vet, an event as safely as possible um, and with no social distancing. Okay. I would sign that form, I would sign the disclaimer and go through that process and be at an event if, that, if those things were in place and proven. So I think they're very close now to having very quick, fast tests. At the moment, that's, that's another issue, that there isn't a test at the moment that's guaranteed efficacy that's quick. And that's rather than waiting for seven hours for a result or whatever. I think this is going to change the industry, at least for the short term. And I think what we all can take lessons from, as an example, what the, the National Basketball League is doing, NBA here, where they put people amazing. in a bubble, it seems amazing. to be successful. Our industry can learn from the sports industry. If you look what Tomorrowland did this year, that, that music festival, I mean, digitally, it was insanely well done. It was spectacular. People would rather be in a crowd dancing with their friends, but they did, you know, we're all, for, we're all going to be forced to adapt a little bit. And I, I just think this industry... I think we'll th thrive and survive because we're made up with creators. So I'm excited to see kind of where it goes and we, we do have to adapt. Working for a big American agency that, you know, sports, very soon you're going to be able to, if you can't buy a ticket to your game or you're probably already doing it or to the basketball match, you could buy front row seats with a virtual headset and be part of that experience. Many, yeah. Obviously I'm writing music, I've got a couple of albums in the bag and all that sort of stuff and we're talking about releasing and I'm like, Literally, even two months ago, I was saying, we have to think about this differently. We have to think about delivering this music differently. I think... You know, we always hear about sellout events. No, you can never get tickets for your favourite festivals or gigs. This could be a really good way of actually playing to more people. Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a visionary. And when I visualise stuff, I can see it. So when I try to visualise being in three countries in one weekend and DJing, I can't see it. Okay. I can't see it. So I trust that. When I think about touring, how we used to tour, I can't see it. So I trust that. So I think we need to think of, have, we have to be innovative. This is the great thing about the music world, right? Is that we adapt. We adapt, man. Whether that's the streaming, whatever it is, but we adapt. You know, I've got, I know people that own pressing plants and they're like pressing more vinyl than they've ever pressed because now people want to acquire. They want something that's tangible because we don't have live shows to go to and stuff like that, you know? I think the virtual model is never ever going to replace live. Absolutely. However, if we think logically about it, it's another way for artists to earn money or to raise money for charity. It's another way for audiences to tune in with their favourite artists if they can't buy a ticket for a festival or an event. You could do private shows for clients. I mean, I think it's great. You know, if you go back to the 70s, when you had um, formats like the Old Grey Whistle Test, which didn't have a stage, it was on the floor and it was in your living room. And it worked. It was very engaging and it was very musical. And the formats were made to watch on a screen. Your garden's not a format. It's, it's basically just a way to survive by doing it on some of the platforms that can do it. But if formats were created and production companies looked at things in a way... I think there was one very successful DJ event where they... They filmed it, and that, I think they had about seven million pay-per-views. The online thing can be as creative as well as you like. You could be doing gigs in gardens. Like It's like, you know, to keep the social... Day. And honestly, I think there's an appetite for it, and I think the audiences, if we don't run gigs soon, they want to see the people that they love musically doing stuff. If, if you were to look at and produce some formats correctly and make them quality entertainment and stream properly, then of course it can work. 
because there's hundreds of thousands of creative people who could get to work. I still think life will be massive, but I also think this is absolutely a new side to the business that's well, look, being be. developed right we, 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 now. It's an addition. It's Once the live comes back, this could be an additional way of doing Imagine a band artists. that sells out, you know, uh, does a touring cycle for 18 months, and then at the end decides to record the last gig and then sell it pay for view to all their fans. Brilliant look addition Led to a tour. Led yeah, Led Zeppelin, amazing. Yeah, biggest, exactly. Why aren't Led Zeppelin doing that? I'm no Arthur C. Clarke or visionary, you know, I knew the internet would be big back in 89, but in no way saw the impact on culture and, and information. Um, I think it is incredible, but I think it is, there's a certain craziness to it. I think you're going to see many, many artists moving forward are going to be diving deep with uh, virtual or AI experiences. I think it absolutely is what is going to be going on in the next couple of years and the, bit, and the technology is going to change and adapt and become better and more yeah, it's, it, it literally i hate to say it but i think it is a new a new side to our business and i think it is the future the of our business i came up with the concept of set for love do you know what i mean and we took that we, we did a night here last year uh, which was obviously raising money for the wells that we're building in Asia and Africa and stuff. But then we took that a step further. Because of that one idea, we did Set Full of Streaming. And we've done it twice now, and that's helped with the COVID re relief fund and, and stuff like that. And were you happy that. with the audience that was achieved well, and the yeah, way it, was, it came across? We, we, you know what, we saved lives. That's the most important thing. And we're using music to do that. You know, so for me, I could be snobby about streaming and saying I don't feel that, do you know what I mean, or whatever, but at the end of the day, I see how can we help people through this? How can, how can we help people through this? We have music. Music is not just something we do in our pastime. It's something that we do, you know what I mean, to comfort people, to help people, to share wisdom and knowledge and love, you know what I mean? So how can we use that energy and help people through this time, you know? All the scenes that I grew up with have come out of social or economic uh, climate. Um, we've been lucky to have that in our lives, you know, whatever people say about Thatcher back in the day, we would never have had rave, we'd never have had summer loves, we would never have the new romantic scene, the two-tone scene. And there is possibly, and I, I hate to say it, possibly some good that might come out of this when we look back in time to come. Now is an opportunity to go into the world that we really want to live in, you know, and how we apply ourselves, what are our relationships like, whether that's to our art or whether that's to people, you know, even thinking about our business models and how our businesses can help people rather than how I can improve my business. You know, there's just a lot of things that I think that, 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 that can give us the opportunity to be on some sort of level conscious playing field in a way that we can recognize our community, we can recognize the world that we live in and start taking care of that and start thinking about it more on that level rather than an individual level or how I've been affected. I personally kind of feel that like earth is not well and, and as has been said, you know, the COVID thing is, has like distracted us from the climate change. I look at commercial farming of animals and you look at COVID and you think there must be a connection to this, you know, this incessant consumerism. At the same time, all these difficulties, I think, essentialize the, the, the energy and power uh, uh, of, of music and, and how it can carry a, a succinct and, and needed message and, and, a, uh, and a support to people's souls really, you know, to give them hope. I'm not saying this because I'm comfortable at home with my family, but for me, it's, King Spain, you know, it's been a very okay, emotional time, around. but it's been, also, like I say, a time where I've just I been sort of looked at things that I've never really looked at before, really you know, and even if that's the infrastructure of the business and the people that work behind the bar or the, the concert venues that I used to play at that are not going to exist anymore and all the important people I've met along the way, you know, it's like to really start thinking about all the different elements that have supported you all along the way. All of us um, have to be a lot more bullish about what we want about the future. I mean, if anyone's quite happy to have another summer off next summer, let's all just keep waiting for our governments to sort these problems out. But the bottom line is they, they, are, they don't know either. So we all need to be a lot more bullish about what we want 
to happen and start lobbying the government and being more vocal. And I think one way to do that is to get the audiences involved. If we were to be telling our audiences now, people who have quite happily, well not happily, but not gone to a club or a gig this summer, that next summer is also going to be off unless we start moving forward, I would imagine people power will start moving things along really quickly. And I'd also like to see, I know there's some great acts here talking about this, I'd like to see more artists and, and DJs in the electronic community talking about this more, because they're not. Yeah, and listen, we are planning for next year. You know, we'll have to at some point push the button, but we are planning, we are hoping that something happens and whether, you know, when you look at what's going on with it now and, OK, there's cases on the rise, but as I was chatting with Andy earlier, you know, but the death rates don't seem to be moving. Now, whether that's, you know, the sort of ill and old people protecting themselves more and protecting the old people's homes where a lot of the deaths happened, or whether the virus is getting weaker, which generally happens with viruses. It happened with the Spanish yeah. flu, with, you know, with SARS and, and everything. So, uh, you know, maybe something, maybe some vaccine comes, you know, early next year and allows things to happen, maybe on a smaller scale or whatever. So at the moment we are planning, uh, but at the same time we are ready to, you know, uh, push the button or not at some point. Yeah, ultimately, we've made the announcement. We are definitely moving forward. I think the question is how we're going to produce it. So we have our Latin Grammys in November. We announced the show date for that and that we were moving that show from Las Vegas uh, to Miami because right now kind of what's happening in the live events business or certainly when it comes to telecast productions is you're chasing talent. So part of the expectation is we can't get all the talent on flights that we want to. We can't necessarily bring everybody into one venue or one room the way we'd want to. So while we're, you know, kind of actively moving forward on a couple productions, one of which I have airing in October, that we're being, the way we're producing it is we're going into studios, we're going into manager's office. I mean, we're going anywhere to record the artists and some of the performances, some of the award presentations where our crews are going out with, you know, very strict COVID guidelines and recording them where we can get them. For the time being, we're hoping to do a large majority of both the Latin Grammys and the Grammys um, live. And the question is whether we can have a large audience, any audience, but uh, the, the hope is to have everybody filmed live, performing live, and uh, time will tell whether we need to do it in multiple locations or if we're going to be able to bring everybody in to one location just with a very different production setup than, you know, kind of business as usual. It was set up here in Ibiza, which is, uh, the, for me, the heart of music. Um, it was set up here uh, with some like-minded people in the real estate sector. Uh, basically, when we saw the, the, uh, the work that the uh, healthcare heroes were doing during this COVID crisis, We've got a whole lot of our um, contacts together and we launched an incentive, whereas now we have over 70 uh, homes, rental homes in Ibiza, some of the most iconic properties in Ibiza, uh, donating their properties to nurses and, and, and ho hospital workers uh, to come and have a respite in the home of music. Nice. What's the name of the uh, charity you set up, Nick? Together for Healthcare Heroes. Uh, and it's for anyone who's working in the front line of the COVID uh, crisis, from the cleaners to the surgeons to the doctors to the nurses, anyone who wakes up every morning, puts their shoes and socks on and goes out and faces this horrible thing. That's amazing. Um, and where can people find out about the charity? Well, our webpage is uh, T4HH, Together for Healthcare Heroes. Uh, and you can go in there, you can donate your properties, you can sponsor. But what, we're not looking for money, we're not looking for, uh, we're looking for reach. You know, and we're sitting on, sitting on a table with some very influential people. And I think if we can actually spread the word by social media, it'll actually reach a lot more people. You know, these nurses and doctors, a lot of them can't afford to come to Ibiza. Ibiza's become a VIP playground uh, out of, the, out of the, 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 the cost, but they can't afford to be here. You know, and for me, I'm, I come from a rugby background, you know, whereas every body, uh, any body type can play rugby. You know, and I believe Ibiza, any, any economic background can actually, should come to Ibiza and enjoy. So my dad, Bill Fuller, who built the electric ballroom in 1938, he would be continuing to do live music. And, you know, he would not let the government stop him. I think he would, he would be very proud of Vince Power coming in and running Van Morrison and just being like, okay, we're, they're 
the show must go on. Musicians, concerts, and certain acts, theaters have to continue happening. If in, in for that moment, the only solution we have is to have with certain difference, distance, sorry, uh, I think we have to try, of course. Um, the Legend Ballroom, we've teamed up with Vince Power and we are doing um, Van Morrison in a series of social distancing live gigs. Uh, we've just got to a stage where we've been closed for five, six months, five months. And we just felt that we have to literally get back to what we love. We have to do something. It's not, it's not what we are used to. Uh, maybe the atmosphere in some things is different, but I think we have to make efforts in not to stop the, the music. Um, in our town hall, for instance, concerts we have continued doing in open air. It's, it's true that have to be seated and with distance, but it's true that it's nice to have, I don't know, Dalbilla, uh, classic concert, or in a, in a big square, or in open air uh, at, at night, to have music, or to have theater, or to have uh, uh, something. Of course, uh, we have to go forward and try to put more people and try to do all in a safe way, uh, but uh, we, we have to continue. It, life has to continue. So I opened up our backyard, which is kind of the load in and load out for bands. And I turned that into a bar and we we're doing like kind of backyard ballroom sessions. And then I Vince came around, I spoke to him and we were like, he's like, you know, Van Morrison really wants to do a gig. He really wants to do the electric ballroom. I think he did the ballroom in the late 60s, early 70s. I don't know. He has it on record. I can't remember what it was. And um, yeah, so he was just really excited because I think we can probably fit three to 400 people socially distant between upstairs and downstairs. I don't know what it's going to be like, but we just need to get back to what we really like doing. You know? We look at different, different options of how we could use the space, keeping the social distance and, and be able to perform in a way. Uh, but obviously the space is very limiting and, and sometimes even the options that we had, uh, they look a bit weird. You know, we are in a, we are in a business that is about love and touching and, and dancing and caring and kissing and, and flirting. And, you know, that's, that's what the, what the, what, what the emotions that we create are, those are built to create that. The moment that you stop that is very difficult. And actually I was, I remember I was inside of the room and I was doing an interview with a French TV. And I was just marking on the floor for them how the tables will be separated. And, and, and they were asking me, how are you going to keep people from crossing the line? I said, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how we will keep people from crossing. I mean, I don't mind the seated thing, but it's a socially distanced thing. It's when the people come in the door, I have to tell them, take their temperature. They have to all, you know, gel their hands you know, go in, anybody standing up, I want them to wear masks. If they're going to the toilets, I want them to wear masks. I mean, it's, it has to be properly monitored. In any case, I saw the, the last event, the concert that they made with the scaffolding platforms in the middle. I mean, it's, it's just a different experience. I wonder if we're going to get used to that in the future. Uh, but it's a different experience. I don't know if it's better or worse. I don't know. It's, it's something that will satisfy a part of... The, for the ones that love live entertainment to be able to enjoy that, even if it's in a platform, I will be very happy with it. I don't know for how long, because you require to dance and, and talk to people. And but yeah, it's uh, maybe we could have done something, but I think we, for us, we need to think about it. And and we have different ideas to implement respecting social distance if we are in a situation that COVID is still there, and uh, and we'll just play with them. We'll try to make it more humanize the situation you know? we make the effort to open it makes us to to look uh, very deeply in all the the safety measures not just for the staff but also for the clients and do all the procedures that the government says i think people need to get together as a community yes. we need to give each other love and support and and, and hope 
hoping for the best, just keeping um, our faith in the universe that it's all going to work out, basically, yeah. But the island is still beautiful and it's still gorgeous, still a fabulous place to come. It's very safe and we are doing all we can to maintain the Ibiza life as it should be. So please come, come to the island. Peace and love to everybody. Who knows what's going to happen? You know, love your family, treasure every moment. There you have it from Ibiza. Uh, the land of milk and honey. <laughs> is the island going to evolve further? Is it going to open next year? Where does where, where do we go with COVID? What happens with live music and festivals back around in the UK and around the world? The government's doing the right thing to support the people. What we've seen uh, and spoken about this week, hopefully will go out as a message to relevant people so that change can happen and we can get back to a normal life. Normality is the way forward. Welcome to the reset, ladies and gentlemen. Adios.